One. Thank you, thank you for the applause. All righty. First John chapter 2, 28. Yes, there are new sheets in the back if you uh, don't have one. Since he said it. Since I said what? We have, um, I left off at, what, 27. Uh, as really 28 is a new beginning, you realize that when the Bible was written, they didn't put in chapters and verses, right? Somebody came along later, I think it was a month or somebody in the teens, uh, century-wise, and they did this, and they didn't match everything up necessarily. There's a few places, you know, you read like maybe Paul's letters or something, and it's like, it seems like this section goes with this section. That's because they didn't write them that way. So, to get going, the United States Treasury uses a number of sophisticated techniques to keep counterfeiters from reproducing the look of paper currency. The exact makeup of the paper, paper bill, is a secret, but it's known that the paper is made up of 75% cotton, 25% linen, with red and blue flecks of silk, plus magnetic ink and, it's an, and an almost invisible ink on the left side of larger bills with an engraved United States of America around the face of the larger bills. The final feature is impossible to reproduce. As the paper is run through machines with high pressure rollers so that it creates a uniform thickness. These measures, of course, do not keep counterfeiters from trying and some get so close to the original, many people cannot tell the difference. It's been said that treasury, FBI agents, and bank tellers are taught to recognize the difference between, between real currency and counterfeit by having them handle the real thing. After they deal with the real currency so much to touch a counterfeit bill, it's easy for them to tell the difference. Deceit, of course, is the whole point of counterfeiting. Someone who does not have the real thing wants someone else to believe he has the real thing. We must be on guard against deceit in regards to money as well as other things in life. Spiritual counterfeiters were in the church in John's day and they're in the church in our day, leading people astray. So 1 John 3, God reveals the characteristics of bad and good so the church can tell the difference between the real and the counterfeit. So as uh, we just said, we closed off uh, 2, 27. So look at those last two verses in uh, chapter 2. John says, Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we have confidence and do not shrink away from him at, uh, shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who also practices righteousness is born of him. So little children gives you the idea that it is a new section, and this was one way that he greeted believers, little children, just a, a term of endearment. The word abide is better understood as remain, so he's saying to remain in him, in Christ. And he's writing, of course, then he's writing about the return of Christ. It appears that John believes some of the people will be ashamed of themselves when Christ returns because they do not know Jesus, nor do they know his righteousness. So three interpretations of these two verses. The first one is John is referring to unsaved individuals who will be ashamed at Jesus' return. The second is, we are to remain in fellowship with Christ or we will lose our salvation and be ashamed at Jesus' coming. And the third is, we are to remain in fellowship with the Lord or we, as Christians, will be ashamed at his coming. Which one do you think is correct? One, two, or three? Three. Three? Anybody else? Three. It's not two, because once you're saved, yeah. you're always saved. 
We're saved because of God, and the only one we can take it away is God. We can't, oh, where did I, where did I, you know, I lost my salvation. Where did I put it? Can't lose it. One, he could be referring to unsaved individuals, but he's writing to believers. So of the three, the third one makes the most sense. Uh, what we have to know is that all people will stand before Christ one day. The question is, which line will you be in? At the judgment seat of Christ, uh, which is for believers, you see that in 2 Corinthians 5.10, or at the great white throne judgment seat, which is for those who do not have a relationship with Christ, which is seen in Revelation 20.11. Who chooses where you go? You do. Exactly. Choose by whether you believe in him or you don't. All right, chapter 3. Let's look at the first three verses here. John says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. And my number pages are out of order. There we go. All right. Uh, so how does a person become a child of God? Confession of sin. Christ is Savior. <clears throat> Jesus is Savior, right? Uh, you know, that's what I was listening for on Sunday when they said, why I want to be baptized? Because of Jesus. Can't get to heaven, can't get saved any other way, right? Yep. If you think you can, let's talk. Only through Jesus. So are we then children of God? Yes. Because of our faith in him. Romans 8, 14 through 17, uh, Paul writes, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. If you have not received a spirit, you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is a, an affair term of endearment that we might uh, translate as daddy. It, it's, you know, to call, to say daddy is not as formal as father. Father, dad, daddy. And so that's what Abba is. It's a term of endearment. Uh, he goes on, he says, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children also heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we might be glorified with him. So how great of a love does God have for us, his children? He's got a great love, doesn't he? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Doesn't say he loves a certain group or particular uh, family, but the world. All of creation that if you believe in his son, you will not perish but have everlasting life. All right, so John writes to the world, now he's talking about in his day, did not know the children of God because they did not know Jesus. Is this true today? Yeah. There's plenty of people out there in the world that don't know children of God because they don't know Christ. Uh, what will the children of God, us, what will we be like when Jesus appears? I've heard this question so many times. When I get to heaven, what am I going to be like? What kind of body am I going to have? Will I be like I was when I was 18? Will it be perfect? Be like him. We'll be like Jesus. So what was Jesus' body like? It was perfect, sinless, pure. That's the kind of bodies we'll have. Now, what's it going to look like? I don't know. What I do know... I don't think it'll be in a body form. I think it will be in a body shape, but not necessarily flesh. Does that make sense? Think about Jesus when he uh, 
resurrected. He appears before the apostles. Did they go, oh, it's a ghost because he was, you know, kind of see-through and all that? No. They saw him eat fish. So he ate. Not that I think we'll have to eat in, in heaven. I don't think we'll have the need. But it also says the door was locked. He wasn't there, and then he was there. How did he get in? Seems like he just walked through the walls or through the door, doesn't it? But he had the idea, the only true answer I can give is what will we be like? We will have a perfect, sinless body just like Christ. As John writes there. So what does John say we are to fix our hope on and why? What is our hope to be fixed on? Your retirement, your home, family. Our hope's in him. Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Our you know what he life. says? Our next life. <laughs> well, you ain't getting there, but it's not through Jesus. We'll uh, put it that way. Yeah, it, it's verse 3. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him. What does that do? It purifies us. This is how we become sinless, pure, because he is pure. We'll be just like him. The children of God are going to be like Christ, will be without sin, will be pure, but not on earth. That's going to be in heaven. Okay? Uh, look at verses 4 through 6. There's a key word in these verses, uh, 4 through 10. Practice it. You might want to underline it or at least make note of it mentally as we go through here. Four and six. Everyone who practices. Now, your translation may say something different. I didn't check. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sin, sins. And in him there is no sin. In Jesus there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. So, according to these verses, what is sin? Huh? The continued practice of lawlessness. Lawlessness. <clears throat> lawlessness can be defined as what? Sin. <laughs> you so much going to do that. <laughs> do we have lawlessness in our world today? Plenty. How would you define a lawless person? I can give you the simplest, easiest answer. They don't obey the law, do they? <laughs> They're without law. Lawlessness. They... Uh, in the Bible, there's a few words that are used, Old Testament, New Testament, for sin. One of them, and I think that's the word that's used here in this verse for sin, means missing the mark. If you've ever, you know, think about a dartboard or, or a bullseye, and you got that little, that's not red, you got that little red spot in the middle, and that's the perfect shot. Well, if we don't sin, we do exactly as God wants. We hit the bullseye. But we often maybe hit just outside of the bullseye. Maybe we're hitting on the outside of the rim. And if you're like me, you don't even hit the target. Okay? You miss the mark. The mark is hitting the bullseye. Sometimes we just miss it by a hair. Other times we're way off. Either way, it's sin. Um, so who is it that sins that commits lawlessness hmm? Everybody. who does what not remain in him okay it's that key word sin. practices sin how do you practice sin over and over it's a habitual habit, or like a habitual habit. So, uh, to practice is to have a lifestyle of sin, to be lawless. You don't care. 
If you are uh, an adulterer, you don't care if you get caught. You just keep doing it. You might come to church. You know, you be Catholic, go in and light your candle and go into confession. Forgive me, Father, I have sinned. I've committed adultery. Go out and do, say all these prayers and you're forgiven. And he goes right back out and does it again. Somebody who's a, a pickpocket or a shoplifter, and they just keep doing it. It's their lifestyle. And they don't want to change. So they practice lawlessness. They practice sin. Jesus came, of course, to take away sin for all who are in him. The children of God will not look... Mm, Children of God will not choose to live a habitual, sinful lifestyle. Now, we all are going to sin sometimes. Uh, some will be even willful. But this is not the behavior in which a child of God will normally live. You know, we don't make it a normal practice to tell a lie, to steal to get angry, to do whatever the sin might be or accommodation thereof. So uh, John 1, 29 says, The next day Jesus saw him coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why he came. 1 Peter 8, 1, 18-20 Knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile, foolish way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was forsaken before, excuse me, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. I worked with a guy years ago. I, I've been in church, you know, as I say, nine months before I was born. Heard the stories and everything else. Never really doubted God, but really did not become strong, growing Christian until I was like 30. And so I was working with this guy, and somehow we got this conversation. His idea was he could go out to a bar, drinking, cursing, get in a fight, go home, sleep it off, wake up and say, God, I've sinned, forgive me. Now that is biblical, 1 John 1, 9. You confess, God forgives. But then he goes on and says, and I can go right back out and do it all over again. So what choice is he making? To live a lifestyle of sin or to live a lifestyle that's right with God? Lifestyle of sin. sin. <laughs> yeah. If you're a Christian, you don't want that. That would be the point. He thought he was good to go because he just said, God, I've sinned, forgive me. You know, that's like Catholic. Well, I go to confession every week. I tell the priest, and he says, you know, say three hallelujahs and an amen, and you're good. And I go right back out and do it all over again. Okay? That's how a lot of people are living today, whether it's Catholic or non-believer at all. They think, I'm all right. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't robbed anybody. You know, I, I may have uh, stole a few things in my time. I may have told a few lies along the line. But I haven't really done anything bad. Does God qualify sin by degrees of badness? Sin is sin. And so once we sin, we sin. Verse 7. Again, practices is the key. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God, you're born again, practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one who does not love his brother which we talked about in the last chapter. 
So, those who practice righteousness are what? <coughs> They're righteous. They are children of God. The one who practices sin is of the devil. devil. Why did God, why did the Son of God appear? To, now, according to these verses, why did the Son of God appear? To stop the work of the devil. To destroy the work of the devil, to stop the work of the devil. Uh, how was this accomplished? What did Jesus do to stop his work? He shed his blood on the cross. He shed his blood. His death and resurrection. <coughs> he paid it all right there. Why don't children of God practice sin or lawlessness? Why don't we practice it? Because God lives within us. God is supposed to be in us so that we don't want to should be the difference there. We have the Holy Spirit. He's our guide. He, he informs us. He reminds us. He goes, you just sin. You know, smack us on the back of the head so, as I said. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, 14, 15, so even God, uh, or even Satan, disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will not be according to their deeds. Paul writes that to the church in Corinth, saying, there are those out there who are sons of the devil, but they disguise themselves as a son of God or a child of God. Am I right or wrong? Is Paul right or wrong? Right. You're right. Yeah. They're out there. Maybe you encountered some in your day. They claim to be a child of God, and it takes a while because, man, they, they, man, they just walk that line but they're just a hair off. And the longer you watch them and the longer you know them, the further they get from being righteous or being right with God. It takes time. You can't see it just like that. But they're out there today as well as in John's day. Um, I didn't cover it, but I meant to. It's in here somewhere. It says that those who... Uh, are right with God, don't sin. Is that right? No, we don't sin. They don't so what do you think John meant? Hmm? They don't practice sin. Practice is the key word. We're going to sin. You watch this online, you hear, we are all <laughs> going to sin. You don't have to commit the act, you just have to think it, and that's a sin according to Jesus. It's those who make a habit. Go back to it over and over. It's like an alcoholic. I've known some, I guess they would call themselves reformed alcoholics in my day, who would say, look, I, I'm not going around this person. I'm not going to this place. They're serving alcohol. Or if they do, they're, you know, I, I, give me a, a non-alcoholic drink. And they're not afraid to say, I don't drink. Because they know one drink and they're off the wagon. It's the same with sin, whatever that sin might be. Well, I used to, but I don't do it anymore. God got a hold of me, but I know if I get near it, I might do it again. And it's not that we're going to lose our salvation, but we will tumble. Satan will pull us down, put his foot on us, and stomp us just as far down as he can to keep us from serving God. Once saved, you're always saved. Doesn't mean we're all going to live the righteous life all of our lives. Verses uh, 11 and 12. This is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, the devil, and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So, love is the message that you've heard from the beginning. Love one another. Whoever they are, Love them. Cain killed Abel as he didn't love his brother. Hence, he was a child of the devil. Cain practiced evil 
Abel practiced righteousness. They both brought offerings to God. You see, Cain was the farmer and he brought fruit of his growing, his harvest. Abel was a shepherd and he brought a lamb, goat, some of his harvest, you might say. What was the difference? I know. Abel brought the best that he had. He brought the best, a spotless lamb, goat, animal. No defects, wasn't sick, no broken body parts. In fact, it would have been all probably one color, not spot, spot, spot. So what did Cain bring? Did he bring his best? Yeah, leftovers is how I've had it. Yeah, but said. it doesn't say that here. Hmm? It doesn't say that. Here. No, you'd have to go back into Genesis for that to find the story of Cain and Abel, but that's what it's referring to is that story of Cain and Abel, how Cain killed his brother Abel because, well, jealousy. Jealousy. God told him, says, look, watch yourself, your countenance. If you're not careful, you're going to sin. But he says, God was like, look, just do better the next time, and it'll be all right. But he couldn't handle it, and so he was jealous of his brother, calls his brother out and killed him. Because as John writes, he was of the devil. He allowed the devil to deceive him, to pull him down, and to say, hey, Take him out of here. Get rid of the competition, so to speak. Um, 13 through 15. <clears throat> Do not be surprised, brother, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Or is it abiding means, uh, can better, I think a better translation is the word remain. So nobody has eternal life remaining in him. You can't lose it, but you never had it if you hate anybody. So John says the world, society, may hate Christians. Why would the society today hate a Christian? Okay, we don't live their way. And if we don't live their way, then what are we saying about the way they live? They're wrong. It's wrong. Yeah, exactly. I, but we are to love them no matter what. If a um, homosexual married couple came to this church, we are to love them and show them love. But, one, we're not to like their lifestyle. Two, we need to let them know God's word says what you're doing is wrong. We love you. You're welcome to come here. Might be the only chance to get to hear the truth, truth of the gospel. But if you say, oh, you know, you got to get out of here. You're wrong. You're a sinner. You're going to hell. What's that going to do to them? That church down there, you know what they told me? Put a bad taste in the community's mouth who doesn't know any better. They think they're better than us. There are churches out there like that. Uh, as I have described and I have seen people that go to share Jesus and they beat them over the head with a Bible. Or as I like to describe it, they use a sledgehammer instead of using a finishing bag. That doesn't win people. That doesn't get them to Jesus. You gotta love them, first and foremost. And so society is going to say, I hate you because of where your stances don't agree with me. And they don't want to say, I'm wrong, God's right. Uh, passing out of death into life is signifying that we are born again, we're believers and have the love of God in us. Without God's love in us, we would 
due to mankind's sinful nature, hate others. Hmm. Just watch the news and that can be proven. Those who do not love abide or remain in death, separation from God. They are murderers because their heart is full of hatred and they are capable of murder. Again, John is speaking about the choice each individual makes concerning the lifestyle they choose to live. Nobody makes them live that way. They might say, well, God made me this way. No, he didn't. You chose to live that way. People choose to be in games. People choose to carry a gun and aim it at somebody and pull the trigger. The gun doesn't shoot itself, right? No, somebody has to pull that trigger. Somebody has to put bullets in it. Yeah, uh, I think about, you don't hear too much about them uh, since we're out of Afghan and, and Iraq, but suicide bombers, Islamic suicide bombers, you know why they did that? They would keep, take their own life. Because they thought if they did it, and they did it for Allah, they'd go straight to heaven, and they'd be rewarded with all kinds of sensual rewards, I'll put it that way. The cleric told them that, but the cleric didn't dress up in a bomb. True. He got somebody else to. People will do things that to me, to put it bluntly, stupid. But they believe because somebody led them to believe that it was the right thing to do. And it suited them. Um, everybody makes their own individual choice. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you do good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Don't have to commit to act. What Jesus is saying, you might just thank it or say it. John 15, 18 through 25. This talks about what, why does the world hate believers and hate Jesus? Does the world hate you? This is Jesus speaking. You know that it has hated me, hated Jesus before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, you choose. But I chose you out of the world because of this world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do for you, do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. They don't know the Father. I claim to, but they don't. If I had come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my Father also. If I had not done, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did they would not sin. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in the, their law. They hated me without a cause. He's talking about the Pharisees and religious leaders who hated him. You know why they hated him? Or should put it this way. Why did the Pharisees and the other religious leaders hate Jesus? Anybody? Jesus was taking away what they were saying. <laughs> well, he, he taught opposite of what they said. But the Jewish religious leaders were given their power by the Romans. And Jesus is coming along and saying, they're wrong, I'm right. And if they follow Jesus, they'd lose their power. They'd lose their position. They'd lose their prestige. That's why they hated him. He was going to take away their ability to live in the world and of the world. Jesus is saying, you're in the world, just don't live of the world. 
uh, Luke 6, 20 through 23, says, Who will be blessed and how will we be blessed? Turn his gaze toward his disciples, Jesus began to say, Blessed are you who are poor. Yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy. Behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. Where's our reward going to be? In heaven. heaven. Not here on earth. If we get everything we want here on earth, what's that say about us? We're worldly. And if you're worldly, you're a child of who? Yeah. yeah. It's all right to have possessions. It's not. Know? Yeah, it's fine to have possessions. It's when you want more and more. Think about the rich young ruler. Jesus, what must I do to go to heaven? Well, obey all the commandments. I've been doing that since I was a kid. One more thing. Sell all you got, give it to the then come follow me. Be on. Be one of my disciples. Set at my feet. What do you do? I can give up all I got. And he goes home. World. Matters of the heart. What do we want? Man, I'm going to try and make it through, but I guess I won't. 16 through 18. We know love. By this, he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide, remain in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. So, how do we know what love is? How do we as Christians know what love is? Actions. Okay. Love actions. Whose action? What Christ did on the cross. What did he do for us? Well, he laid down his life. He laid down his life. If it wasn't for Christ, where would we be? Lost. Separated from God. Lost. So... John 3, 16, for God so loved, he sent his only son to die on a cross, be buried so he could raise him from the dead on the third day to forgive us who believe in him of our sins. That is love. Okay? Since we the believer know what love is, then what should we do? Should we get nailed to a cross for somebody? We should love everybody. Okay, how should we love everybody? Our actions. Compassion. Actions, compassion. There's a certain word I'm looking for. Unconditioned. Did God look down or Jesus look down and say, I am dying for you and you, but not you? Because I know what you've done. Jesus died for the Roman soldiers that nailed the nails in his hands and feet. He died for the high priest and all the people in that Sanhedrin said, let's take him before the Romans and get him crucified. He died for them. He died for the worst murderer you could ever think of. He loves everybody unconditionally. That's it. If a homosexual couple comes in here, we know the lifestyle they're living is wrong, we are to love them. Why? Because Jesus would. But he would also say, you're living wrong. He'd do it with love. There's a, there's a difference between telling somebody, you're a sinner, and saying, can I share something with you? Jesus is not going to beat them over the head. He's going to love them. As the old saying goes, you get more flies with honey than you do vinegar, right? Um, so.
So how do we love unconditionally? How do we love unconditionally? One thing, we don't expect anything in return. Very good. We do without expecting something in return. What are, what are some examples that we can do to uh, show love towards others? I, I just, my, how we love uh, is being unselfish. We love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, willing to stand by a brother no matter what. Help those in need, sharing of what we have, not closing our hearts, being unconditional in our love. So Christians are the show of love for others, not by mere words, he says, but by what they do. So what are some things we can do to show love for others? You know when y'all speak all at the same time, I can't hear you. <laughs> what are some things we can do to show unconditional love or just love towards someone else? Be interested in them as a person. Pay attention to them, yeah. What else? Take food when there's a crisis. Don't have to be a crisis. Why just say, hey, I made a cake and brought you a slice or whole plank, whatever. Just out of love. You, uh, what else? Give them a job so they can earn money. If, if they need it, yeah. Or help them find a job. I say listening to them, to me, is half the battle with anybody. We can, as we're going to do here in a few, pray for them. And let them know you're praying for them. You know, whatever, especially if they got something going on in their life. Hey, I, I pray for you. I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Is there a way I can pray for you specifically? Um, you know, give of ourselves or possessions. You need to borrow my car. You need, you need a pound of sugar. You know, don't put, well. Certain people you wouldn't loan a car to. Uh, yeah. Yes, but we don't want need to be checking their DMV records to see. <laughs> we might want to, but if, if you know that they have a bad driving record, you might want to drive them yourself. So. But the idea is you need a shovel, you, 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 you need a wheelbarrow, you, you need a pound of sugar, you need a, a, a listening ear. We don't don't qualify what we're going to get. Just be there in need. Just be there. Do whatever. Available. It's not like, yeah, be available. And it's unconditional. It's not about, oh, look, I'll sit and listen to you for 10 minutes, but did I need you to come help me? You know, it, it's, that's a tit for tat. Shouldn't matter. Go and listen. I mean, years ago, uh, <coughs> ladies, two dear ladies that were in my church their mother was passing away went to the hospital to visit that's when you could go in the hospital as a pastor and visit and uh, we sat there and talked and they were sharing about their mom and some of the things that she, she must have been a character she was unconscious the whole time I never got a chance to talk to her I probably sat there for two hours just listening to them talk did I have somewhere else to go probably uh, you know, dinner time was probably getting close, but uh, just what they needed, just to laugh and talk, share about their mom. You know, that's a lot. You think about people in our world, maybe you know some. They're hurting. Do you know they're hurting? Probably not. Why would they be hurting? They think nobody loves them. I see on the uh, uh, news, there's two brothers that killed that uh, state trooper a week or so ago now. Do you think that they uh, believe somebody loved them? Probably not. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes just going and sitting, <laughs> listening to somebody. I love you. A hug, a handshake, even a pat on the back. 
is a sign of love towards somebody else. We all need it, don't we? That, that was one of the bad things about COVID and isolation. Couldn't touch. Couldn't even go around mm -hmm. others. Caused depression, I guarantee you, amongst probably half the population, if not more, because couldn't go. Heard one lady on news today said she lost her grandmother during COVID. It wasn't because of COVID. She thought it was because of isolation. She was a hugger. She couldn't hug anybody. Nobody could go see her. She was isolated. Everybody know what I mean? Love is the original commandment and is key. All right, any uh, questions, anybody, anything? On all of that, we'll stop there. And uh, pick up next week. Verse what?